So um, we're going to start off today talking about uh, chemical properties and descriptors for QSAR and more generally for molecules and small molecules. So um, first of all, we kind of need to understand what descriptors are, uh, also call them features and, you know, in, in other parlance. Um, but basically, they're just any way that we can describe a molecule with numbers. So um, and it doesn't even need to be, it can be a vector of numbers, it can be a single number, it can be a, a, a scalar value like one that is completely unrelated to the molecule, but it's just a constant. Um, and so using this type of thing, we can actually also be able to filter molecules, um, which I think you got a little bit of a taste of yesterday with uh, some of the intro into molecule filter. Um, but look, I'll, I'll show you a few other examples of that uh, this morning to kind of give you a, a bit of a more of an idea of what all those types of things you can do with that. Um, in the end, of course, we're going to be making descriptors for, for actual training models. So the idea there is that we want to have descriptors that are going to tell us something about the molecule's distribution of properties. So does it have a lot of charges that are really close together? Are they mostly um, positive charges that are really lo localized or maybe the negative charges are more distributed, that sort of thing. Um, so to describe that, the way that we oftentimes will, um, will compute this and the way that you'll see it most often in our papers is with what we call autocorrelations. So for an autocorrelation, you, st you start off looking at uh, each of these atoms and look out one bond, two bonds, three bonds, and so forth, and then just count up the, um, well, actually compute a function on the distribution of, say, charges at each of those different bond distances. Um, so if we see that there's a whole bunch of negative negative charges that are right next to each other, which ordinarily shouldn't happen in a molecule uh, one bond apart, then we would get a whole bunch of signal here in bin three. Um, and if that is somehow correlated with activity, then hopefully the model will pick up on that. Uh, and then we can go out further and further, more and more bonds, um, all the way out as far as you want in practice. But um, in, in reality, we usually keep it to about five to six bonds, simply because with 2D descriptors, um, usually you're gonna start seeing a lot of uh, 3D spatial effects once you get out past about five, six bonds. You're gonna have a lot more um, variance kind of in, in where those charges might be in space, depending on what the actual geometric arrangement of those bonds is. Um, so for that case, what we do use instead is 3D autocorrelations, um, especially. So there we actually are taking into account the 3D structure of the molecule, and we're looking at different uh, distance bins and looking at the charge distributions or of some other signed property distributions in those uh, bins, a, a given distance away from a, uh, each target atom. And then we sum that up across the whole molecule. Um, the plus, plus, minus, minus, and minus plus here refer to the fact that uh, for each signed property, you can have um, you can have different different sorts of what, different sorts of properties there that will um, give you that signal at that particular bin. So you might have two negative properties on the atoms at a given distance apart, or you might have two positive. And well. Um, the traditional autocorrelation will just multiply those together, but in fact, the, uh, and so then you would end up with positives in both cases. But in fact, those are pretty different uh, signals. So in the BCL, one of the things we've added and heavily uh, advocated for in the QSAR world is using um, these signed 3DA autocorrelations where we actually keep those, uh, keep the, the values separate for each different sign combination. So it's something you'll see a lot in our papers and something that you'll might even run across in, in later in the tutorial for QSAR. Um, so this is just the equation we use here. Um, but I'm not gonna go into that too much except to mention, we do have the option of having the sort of traditional RDF scale, uh, smoothing factor, um, but it's not terribly important for the models. We've done extensive benchmarking on that. And so uh, it, it proves that it's, it's proven not to be not as useful as some in the literature thought it was initially. Um, that's about all I want to say about that. I'll show you real quickly uh, just some other ways you can use descriptors to maybe filter molecules. Yeah, we're using. 
using this. And would those still see this? I think so. You guys can see this okay? Cool. Thanks, Jenna. Awesome. So um, here we have just a simple uh, BCL command line where we're going to take a uh, an input molecule and add a property, number of rotatable bonds, and we're going to output that to another uh, SDF file. So this is kind of the absolute basic, most simple case you can get with molecule properties. Um, and bam, we now have a file that hopefully actually has our um, our uh, our number of our properties on it. So if we go to documents, demos, and plot of properties, assuming that less actually works, we can see that uh, end rope bond is now in here. So, um, okay, that's mildly amusing perhaps, but wouldn't it be nice if we could actually just filter out things that have ridiculous, uh, I, I don't know, some, some particular property that's out of bounds for what we would usually want. So bear with my terminal usage. Let's say that we want to find everything that has uh, a high number of uh, rotatable bonds. Let's just say that we want to compare property values in that case. So this is one of the flags that we have in uh, molecule filter, uh, compare property values. Um, and we want to say that it's maybe it's greater than five or something. Greater five, okay. And then we can actually output that now to um, same file again, just for fun. Output matched, yes. <laughs> Given flag output is unknown, perhaps you meant one of these. So this is one of the other things that's good to know about with BCL. If you mess up a flag name um, in some very trivial way, which honestly I do every single time I run BCL almost, it will usually say perhaps you meant one of these and um, it'll give you a list of things that it thinks it's more likely you probably meant. And yeah, so it, it comes in pretty handy um, rather than having to read through the docs each time. And uh, unfortunately in this particular case, these, these particular molecules apparently did not have any that were uh, where in rope bond was greater than five. Um, uh, ben just informed me that there's actually like only one molecule in this file. But that <laughs> um, gives the idea, though, is that you can actually, if you did have like a large uh, file that had, say, a whole bunch of different molecules, and you wanted to look at the ones with a particular set of filters, you could do that. You can even chain them together here by saying, um, you know, you could actually add like an extra filter. Like maybe I want to also make sure that in atoms is greater than um, 100. Um, I can actually chain as many of these together as I want, and it will then just do an and on all of those by default, and then it will write them out to the output matched. You might be wondering also why there is the term output matched. Um, well, that's because there's also an output unmatched, um, which actually allows for the molecules that, that did not pass the filters. Um, so, and this is, comes in handy when you're also trying to prepare your data set and you want to find the molecules that maybe don't pass a particular filter, like maybe one of my filters is actually defined atom types. And uh, like this, well, in that case, maybe I actually want to then see the molecules where they did not have defined gas tiger atom types, um, which that's not technically a descriptor, but it's a good thing to know about that's there so that you can figure out if there's some particular uh, atom types that maybe that we're missing that you really would like to have. Um, and, you know, Maybe you can actually add that as a feature request or go in and, and uh, input them yourself into the code if you are a developer. Um, that's kind of the things I wanted to hit on with this. Um, are there any general questions about, oh, I should probably show the help, some of the help for this maybe. Yeah, so if you get stuck and you don't know, well, what, what descriptors are actually available? I think we probably covered this yesterday some, but, um, I don't think it ever hurts to uh, mention it again. So if I go back to the properties one, it's probably easiest. Rather than having in row bond here, I could actually just have said help. Um, and hopefully that will bring me up a huge list of things that is can be uh, computed for um, as descriptors. So what you'll see here is this is a very large list. We've spent a lot of time putting together a lot of descriptors. 
uh, they come in many different forms. There are string properties, which are things like atom types, bond types, chirality. You won't use those too much. The one that maybe comes up once in a while is a map string. So what this is, is when you have a file that maybe is just a CSV and it has some mapped property, like say like the actual activity of the molecule, um, for each molecule, you can use map string to get that property onto your file um, by parsing it in and then just associating it with some other property on the molecule. Um, then we have simple, uh, we have uh, descriptors of molecules. You'll see that we always split these up into things, uh, different categories. So here we have basic implementations. These are things where you don't even need to give it an argument generally, and they tend to be the simplest things. Um, so like Lipinski violations, H-bond acceptor. Um, these are things that should be fairly intuitive uh, to most of you, I think. Um, number of macrocyclic uh, rings, um, weight, and so forth. Then we have things that are customizable implementations. So these might be a little bit more complex, but they might have a few properties you can set. So things like uh, entropy, uh, um, quasi-harmonic approximation. You know, it's not the most trivial of descriptors, but it's actually quite useful. But you do have to give it a few different arguments. Um, and so then like, let's say I actually want to know something more about that particular one, um, because entropy QHA is really cool. And Ben and I spent a lot of time on it. Three days on it. Well, okay, we spent three days on it, Ben tells me. So if I wanna get help on that one and I wanna know more about it, I actually just do that. I just do add help. And uh, now I get a huge set of parameters because this one can take a confirmation sampler is the reason why most of this is here. Um, but it will actually tell me everything I could possibly add in for this particular um, descriptor, which is in this case is, is probably one of the most uh, fully featured descriptors in the BCL. So it has just about everything. Um, so that's kind of how you get additional help. Uh, the other thing you'll see is besides the um, customizable implementations, we also have things like uh, operations. So operations are things that take another descriptor and somehow modify it. So you can think of them kind of like a wrap as a wrapper. Um, and in some cases, you'll even see binary operations, things like add, subtract, divide, equals, less, and so forth. Um, so any type of mathematical operation you want to do or just about on your descriptor, you can do by using one of these types of wrappers. And they're all you know, listed here so that you can easily find the ones you want. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly what I want to say about that. Um, oh, I should mention, so for 3DAs, 3DAs is probably one of the most common uh, descriptors we use. You'll find that here. Um, and there again, actually we want 3DA smooth sign is really the one we want usually, but let's see here, 3DA, if I can only find it. I think we actually call it 3DA soft max or, this, or actually it's 3DA soft. Oh, is it, three, is it lowercase? Okay, all right. Yeah, so we do have the 3DA in there and so forth. Um, but yeah, so, you can use these properties in molecule properties. You can either take statistics of them, you can just add them to the file to look at them. Um, and you can also use filter to filter out things with certain properties. Uh, and I think that's mainly what I wanted to hit on. Cool. Yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so, so as Jeff sort of walked you through, um, you did some of the filtering yesterday with properties, but I want sort of you to take away that properties exist in multiple contexts in the BCL. So you can use them to, as Jeff showed, just add properties to a file, compute statistics and output new files, tabulate data and output those files. Um, or as we were discussing um, initially is generating data sets with them for QSAR. And so the, the descriptor framework, the property framework in the BCL is pretty extensive. Um, it's also one of the most accessible areas to start developing in the BCL. So if you have an interest in cheminformatics and you wanna contribute code, um, the descriptor framework is a very modular, very friendly sort of place to start developing. Um, and so there are obviously reasons why why descriptors are useful for um, for just filtering data, for labeling data, for for better sort of understanding your molecules. Um, 
but things like autocorrelations are usually used for, for training neural networks or training some type of QSAR model. And, and a lot of neural networks today are not, they don't use handcrafted features per se. I'm sure everyone who's familiar with, with machine learning in recent years has, has sort of come across um, this idea that, that we're sort of in a, in a lot of ways or in a lot of fields like a, a post features or post handcrafted features sort of um, environment where, where people want to instead just pass some representation of the thing that they're interested in learning about to the neural network and let it figure out all of the relationships. Um, and in some ways, this can be really, really powerful, um, as, as we all know. Um, but in, in chem informatics, we're in a little bit of a different boat. Um, and, and it's largely because we don't have the level of data that a lot of other fields have. You know, a, a large training set for us is a few hundred thousand samples. More commonly, we're in the regime of a few hundred to 10,000 or something like that for a particular uh, model training exercise. And so um, I wanted to touch on this a little bit because over the last few years, obviously machine learning has been super powerful. Uh, as Jens discussed yesterday, machine learning was the original sort of um, motivation for, for him to start writing the BCL. So, so what do we do with, with sort of more modern machine learning architectures? Um, and so I'll, I'll start off by saying that when I started my, I guess when I rotated in the lab in 2015, I'm an MD PhD student, so then I took a break and then I came back in 2017. Um, there's this big, big hoopla about AtomNet, which was like a deep convolutional neural net for, for sort of um, taking protein ligand complexes and using um, protein ligand fingerprints and training a, a convolutional neural net to make corrections to the autodoc score function um, using that. Um, there was a similar one released by Ragoza et al. that, that did something um, similar. And then um, there was something called DeepVS that was also used for virtual screening. And everyone was all about these because on all the benchmarks, they um, had gotten really superb performance. So everyone was really excited about these. Um, but then, you know, fast forward a few years um, and, and a few groups started to be more critical of, of a lot of these things. You know, we've had internal lab meetings about this. Matthias Rari published a really great paper and, and actually retrained some of the models that had caused a lot of the hype and found that a lot of the signal is due to, to essentially models learning too much about the small molecule inputs and not really anything about the, the protein ligand interactions. Um, a few papers have come out that have shown that a lot of these, these types of performance improvements may actually be biased due to inadequate training data or, or not very rigorous um, sort of training sets. And so um, if you, you know, we're lucky in the MITRE lab to have a lot of industry collaborators as well. And if you, if you look at a lot of what they use for QSAR, um, random forest, which is not a neural network, is an extremely popular method that's still used quite a bit. Um, Extreme gradient boosting is becoming increasingly popular, which is more in line with the family of methods like random forest. Um, we also, um, there's also a really a nice, a nice paper that, that uses a random forest and then also an extreme gradient booster to, um, a gradient booster to, to correct terms and autodox score function. And it, it generalizes a bit better than some of the neural network papers. And so um, in, in chem informatics, we're a little bit, we're a little bit, um, Unfortunately, despite a few years of intense research, not benefiting quite as much from some of the, the creative new network architectures that other fields are benefiting from. But does this mean that, you know, so, so that was for structure-based sort of protein ligand interaction stuff. What about just ligand-based QSAR? Um, is there any benefit to using these other methods? Um, and, and the answer is, is sort of, there's not, there's not a, a huge reason to replace all of the existing random forest gradient boosting, et cetera, at the moment. But um, there are some interesting areas where, where some of the graph-based neural nets have been interesting. Um, this is a paper that looked to see how well you could learn essential fingerprints and whether or not they could outperform other descriptors. Um, and and they, they found that ECFP4, which is a handcrafted descriptor, performs a, about the same or slightly better than, than the, the GCN version. Um, Chemception, um, another thing, I mean, the general idea we think, and, and you know, uh, Lance in our lab is doing some research on, on this, and we're, we're certainly very interested in this topic, you know, in what domains can we use some of the more modern machine learning architectures to, to be um, advantageous over sort of handcrafted and traditional machine learning models and, and machine learning models that are not neural networks. Um, and the answer is that, uh, you know, in QSAR, it's, it's going to be sort of task specific. And so 
Um, there, there are a lot of tasks that, that you're fine using a lot of the older methods and, and we do screens all the time with them. There are some tasks, especially related to QSPR, where maybe some of the, the graph-based convolution neural nets have, have some advantage. Um, we, uh, we're really interested in, in trying everything, um, but uh, I just sort of wanted to preempt this idea potentially that um, there's not a use for features in, in QSAR because, um, yeah, we've, we've been studying this extensively quite a bit lately. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, so it's the takeaway really is, you know, as you start to approach the BCL, you know, learn about computing chemical properties for, for managing your data set, learn about computing chemical properties for, for generating feature data sets, um, learn about the different neural networks that are available and, and other machine learning methods that either take structures as they are and, and try to train on those or take features of those structures. Um, we try to make the data as modular as possible so you can actually export data from the BCL and train in, in other ML packages as well. Um, and you'll see some of that in, in the coming tutorials. But um, I think that's everything we have. This is how you compute chemical properties. These are some of the uses for chemical properties. This is sort of a brief synopsis of machine learning and handcrafted features in uh, cheminformatics sort of space at the moment. Um, I think we're happy to take any questions for a few minutes, but I think um, I think other than that, you guys can can start working on tutorial number two. Um, which will be the tutorial on uh, how to actually compute and generate data sets. And it'll go over some of the topics that we covered today. There's even an exercise where you get to try to compute the variance of a 3D autocorrelation at different distance bins for uh, 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 essentially an ensemble of conformers for several molecules to see at what point uh, do you think uh, it's worth having a cutoff so that way you don't introduce more noise than necessary into your machine learning model. Uh, so yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we get started? Uh, hi, Ben. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Yeah, sure. a small uh, question. So in the slide of the uh, auto correlation, uh, there is the word uh, delocalize uh, in mm. the title. So what does that delocalize mean? Yeah, let me let me hop back to that. Um, that's a good question. Thanks, Lance. So if you think about um, these autocorrelations, you know, as Jeff was discussing, you essentially are looking for density of properties of, about uh, particular points with respect to each of the different distance bins. And so, for example, at the three bond sort of distance bin for a 2D autocorrelation, you're going to get a, a sum of, of sort of all of the, the property, the sum of squares of all the, the property density at that particular point. The idea being that at three bonds, you can be three bonds out. So if you start from this atom, you can go one, two, three. If you start from this atom, you can go one, two, three. If you start from this atom, you go one, two, three. And then for each of those three bond distances, you're going to have these three additional time pairing bins. Um, but all of those are just one bin. And so you're not actually storing information at different substructures of the molecule. You're storing information um, as it relates to how properties are distributed in distance bins. And so in that sense, autocorrelations are delocalized because they don't memorize the structure. They're just telling you something about the aggregate properties. Same thing with the 3D autocorrelation. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically uh, different things in different locations are going to uh, merge it together in just one bin. Exactly, exactly. Um, whereas, you know, uh, you know, you're working on a lot of the, the graph convolutional lens for ligand-based QSAR, um, we've talked about this before. Maybe one of the exciting things there would be, um, you know, with these autocorrelations, we can do scaffold hopping really well in QSAR because we can identify molecules that have different topologies but have chemical similarity. Um, but for, for something that explicitly encodes information about the underlying structure of the molecule, you might have more luck um, with activity cliffs or, or sort of hit explosion around a particular set of scaffolds. Gotcha. Thank you. One thing I wanted to add, Ben, um, one, you know, I, of course, uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, the sort of handcrafted descriptors is kind of uh, something that seems almost scary today, or it's something that seems arcane or uh, old fashioned. And so I'm not even sure how many people even maintain these things anymore uh, in terms of handcrafted feature sets. But, you know, as Ben was talking about, there is still quite a bit of benefit to being 
to being able to use such a set because it requires a lot less data to train. So you can use a relatively small uh, set of uh, compounds that a collaborator gives you and still train, you know, a reasonable model without, because your, your model doesn't need to learn all about, you know, 3D invariance and all these other things that it might otherwise need to pick up on, depending on what type of neural network architecture you were using otherwise. So um, with, the, with the BCL, if you've actually installed it from source, there actually are some uh, sort of our two customized uh, descriptor sets that we usually use. One is just intended for a quick screen, um, sort of like a minimal set. It's just 400 descriptors. Um, the other one is uh, is a little bit more. It has a few a few additional things like um, 2DA max and and 3DA max, that sort of thing, where you're actually looking for the maximum value at a given distance, um, which helps get rid of some of that delocalization, but it, while still being able to look, while still being able to identify some really the most interesting parts of the molecule, if you will. Um, and that one's about 1,200 descriptors, but that's already been put together. And these are already published uh, descriptor sets um, from the from, from some of our different publications. So, um, you know, if there's any interest in actually using existing descriptor sets where you only have a small data set, we, we already have that. Uh, it comes with the BCL. So I just wanted yeah. to mention that. That's a good point. It does come with the BCL, and we've got a lot of just experimental ones around the lab. So if anybody's ever interested, we... Um, I mean, that's a good point. I know that that when Oin defended her thesis, she talked about screens that she did where she trained on just a few hundred compounds and identified new scaffolds that were active. And our last dopamine receptor screen, we have identified, we had a really high hit rate and we only had about a thousand or 1200 compounds in our training set. So, so like Jeff said, the benefit is in these low data regimes, you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of signal. Um, in any event, um, I think, unless there are any more questions, I should let you guys go. And, um, just like yesterday, you know, we're gonna walk around the lab and we're gonna help people who are here. If you guys have questions, please let us know over Zoom or over um, the Slack channel. Um, in addition to helping you guys with the tutorial, we're going to try to address all the Mac issues. So wish us luck. <laughs>